Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. I've finally thrown off my cold so I can start to make more videos uh, talking at the camera without sounding disgusting. And uh, I've got myself a new axe. So viewers of the Facebook page, link below, um, will have already seen uh, bits of this axe, but here it is in all its glory. Um, I'm probably gonna do some other videos about axes very, very soon. Um, and uh, But this is a particular type of um, Indo-Persian axe. I'll specify that a little bit more in a second, but generally speaking, this is a type of Indo-Persian battle axe um, that was in use in the 1600s and 1700s, quite commonly. Most of the ones you um, find surviving are, I believe, 18th century examples. I'm not exactly sure how to date this example. Um, for various reasons I'll go into in a second, I think it might be relatively old. Um, but um, they were still used in the 19th century. So I did a previous video about Indian axes, just search my videos for Indian axes. And um, in fact, I've done several about Indian axes in general, but not specifically this type. Um, and in that, I showed a little bit of um, original artwork from the period. And, um, you know, these were still used in India, even in the, certainly in the beginning of the 19th century, maybe not very much by the end of it. But um, why? Well, primarily, as I said in that video, because people in India, in many parts of India, were not necessarily fighting against, um, you know, kind of uh, British or French or Dutch or whatever other armies using modern, uh, modern kind of um, equipment and tactics, but they were sometimes fighting against each other. And not to say that they didn't have people with matchlock, mus matchlock muskets, and in some cases flintlock muskets at the beginning of the 19th century. In fact, they did, many of them did. Um, but in addition to that, they often had to face what we would call in Europe at the time, heavy cavalry, that is um, people wearing armor. And so really this is a weapon that fits very much into the context of armored fighting. Um, this is a heavy ax, uh, although it's not super heavy. First of all, as I mentioned in that previous video, the shaft is hollow. Um, and uh, you can actually see that this one has got a couple of dents up near the head, which may indicate use, who knows. Um, in fact, it's got a little ding in the hammer face as well and a couple of little chips in the ax blade. So it could indeed have been used. I mean, this is the sort of ax, it's not something that's gonna perish. It's easy, uh, it's um, more difficult to damage something like an ax or a mace than it is a sword. So in some ways, if this was made, let's say this was made in 1680, it's entirely possible that in 1780 it was still in use, it's still being carried. So um, things like this could see very, very long periods of use and could be passed down from uh, grandson to son to, um, uh, uh, sorry, from grandfather to, uh, to son to grandson. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely, this may have seen a very long period of use. And it, the other thing to mention is the reason it's so difficult to date these is the design didn't really change from about the 16th century, so really from the 1500s, right there. And you find this with many Indian weapons, you find it with Indian talwars, you find it with um, certain, well, basically katars, loads of Indian weapons, putters, dan putters. You find absolutely loads, kukris to a certain extent as well, you find loads of Indian and Indian area uh, weapons didn't really change much from about the 16th century right the way through to the 19th century and in some cases the early 20th century. So these axes were essentially an invention or a, a, the design, this specific design was an invention of the, I believe, the late 16th century. But by process of elimination, most of them that survive, um, be, because, um, because obviously the further back you go, the less survival there is of material, most of them that survive are probably 17th, 18th century. Um, and indeed, some of them are 19th century. Were they still making them in the 19th century? Well, I'm sure they were. Um, my impression is that the ones made in the 19th century are not as good quality as the earlier ones, probably because they weren't being used so much. They were probably more for show. Um, and less for bashing people in armor. Definitely there was a trend even in India for there to be less armored opponents or less armored soldiers um, as you go later in period basically because of firearms, more or less. Um, uh, just, um, you know, in a larger sense, in a, in a bigger picture sense, you could say, because warfare was changing, really. Similar to Renaissance Europe, people often go, oh, armor disappeared from the battlefield because of guns. It's not quite as simple as that. It's not because you can shoot someone in the body who's wearing armor with a gun and it will go through their armor all the time. 
It's not always true. Certain types of armor are certainly pistol proof. The expression bulletproof, I'm sure 99% of you know this, but bulletproof comes from the dent that they used to shoot with a pistol into a breastplate to leave a dent there. And that was the proof, i.e. stamp, of a bullet, i.e. bulletproof. So bulletproof showed that the, um, the cuirass, or the breastplate particularly, was pistol proof. Uh, why pistol? Well, because of course, most by this point, uh, most breastplates and most armor was being worn by heavy cavalry and the firearms that they were most often coming up against when they were fighting other cavalry were pistols or sometimes carbines, but generally not full-size muskets or arquebuses. Anyway, so going back to the Indian axes. So um, hollow shaft, probably, um, probably 18th century, could be 17th century, could conceivably be even late 16th century, could be 19th century, but I don't think so. Um, why do I think? Why do I not think so? So that's the thing that's peculiar about this. And I said fundamentally, this is an Indo-Persian style axe. If you look anywhere on Google Images, if you just Google image um, Indo-Persian axe, you'll find things that look like this. Sometimes they've got a spike there. Sometimes they've got a spike there. Sometimes they've got another axe blade. Occasionally happened, although not very, not very common. And sometimes the pommel end. And that's right. Even with an axe, you can sometimes end someone rightly, um, but the pommel, even more so, because I'll explain in a second, with some of these, the pommel end unscrews and tung, a dagger comes out. How cool is that? So with those, you literally could unscrew the pommel and throw it at an opponent and end them rightly, um, even more effectively than the sword. Right, so um, uh, off the mems and back onto the history. So these are generally speaking known as Indo-Persian axes. However, why am I caveating this? Well, there's a few things about this axe which make me not entirely sure. I think it probably is Indian. I think it's almost certainly Indian made, but there are a couple of things that make me not entirely sure that it was made for Indians to wield. Um, okay, and those two things are the script on the axe. Now, I suspect, I strongly suspect, I'm gonna try and focus on it. Let's try this. I don't think, ah, there we go, you can see it. Let's put focus back on. There is some text on the hammerhead of the axe there, okay? And there is, in fact, if we look at the side, you'll see there's nice pictures, we'll, we'll talk about those in a second. On the side of the axe here, there is some more script, okay? So that's actually showing up better than I thought it would. You catch the light on it, there we go. Now. I've done a little bit of research on this. I'm sort of familiar with some Indian scripts uh, already from other weapons that I've owned and other bits of research I've done, but I don't recognize that. And I immediately, I was like, that doesn't look Indian to me. Um, but having said that, I'm not an expert on Ingu Indian linguistics. And actually with subsequent research, I went back and looked into the roots and the older roots of Indian scripts and found that there is a, um, a script called Brahmi, um, related to the word Brahmin, um, which actually is the root for lots of other scripts, including um, uh, including various different types of Indian scripts, including through a kind of um, a winding route, actually, I believe for Korean script, perhaps for um, uh, Japanese and um, for Mongolian script. And that is interesting because when I actually looked at Mongolian script, it actually looked more like this. Um, and this isn't, doesn't seem to be exactly Brahmi script. It may be another form of Indian early script, but it doesn't seem to be exactly Brahmi script. And I can't match any of the letters on here with letters that I can find online. Um, is, I, I can't match it exactly with Mongolian either, but it kind of looks a bit like Mongolian. In fact, there are a couple of letters in there which you can find in the Mongolian uh, alphabet, if you want to call it that. Um, so that's the first thing. The first thing is, what is this script? It, I was expecting, you know, when I initially saw pictures of this axe before I had it, I assumed that that would be some typical Indian script or maybe Arabic, because this is in its shape and form and construction and everything else, an Indo-Persian axe. And I expected that to be saying something about Allah or some other kind of, prof, you know, some type of um, prophet or something, Muhammad, or um, I expected it to be a Mughal or something like that script, but it's not, not as far as I can tell. So it's a bit mysterious. It's entirely possible that this is an Indo-Persian axe made for export um, and that it, it was made for someone it, somewhere else, could be anywhere in Asia, commissioned a battle axe 
to be have this text put onto it or maybe they looted or captured a an Indo-Persian battle axe in war and had that text put on it afterwards because it's I would say it's probably acid is it acid etched? I think it's probably acid etched. So it could have been put on after the axe was created. So there's all sorts of possibilities. So um, if you go to my Facebook page, uh, link below as always, and obviously give the page a like please, but also um, have a look there. You can see the um, script more clearly there. And uh, feel free to go on Google, Google Images, and search for different types of old script. Now, there's two other things connected to this as well, which are why I find it difficult to place and date this axe. That particular text, whatever it is, all of the similar texts that I can find are old. Um, they're, as far as I can tell, they're not texts that were still in use, at least in widespread use, in the 19th century. So the fact that it's on there might suggest that this is an older example. It might be, I don't know, is it a 16th century example? I don't know. But there's one other thing, and I'm gonna turn the axe around here. You caught a glimpse of it before. Right, so let's get this focusing on. Let's get my face out shot. Right, can you see there? I'm just gonna, there we go. So here we've got two figures sitting either side of a tree and in the tree is perched a bird of some kind of dove or something else. And there seem to be kind of apples or some other type of fruit pears maybe lying around the bottom. Now those figures, if I let's see how close I can get this to focus. Those do not look like Indian clothes to me. Look at their little hats. They've got little pointy acorn typed hats with dangly bits off the back. Now, I've looked at quite a lot of Indian manuscripts and I don't remember seeing anyone dressed like this. They seem to have long coats with long sleeves. They're dressed up quite warm and they've got little pointy acorn hats. Now, to me, that looks like Mongolian clothes. Um, they absolutely, I mean, it could be Persian, uh, maybe. I mean, I know that you do get clothes more like that in Persia. Maybe you do in India. Maybe I just don't know. Um, and I would imagine that this represents a story. It's a very, it's a very specific scene. Just get it focusing again. It's a very specific scene having a tree with kind of leaves, leaves, leaves. Come on, focus. Bird in the top, figure, figure, and then fruit around the bottom. I can't help thinking that to someone who knows what that is, they're gonna go, oh yeah, that's the story of so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and they're sitting under the tree of whatever piece with the dove sitting on top, I'm just guessing. Um, but I'm sure that that represents some kind of known story. And interestingly, on the other side is more, um, the image is the same, exactly the same on the other side, but it's not quite as well preserved, which is why I'm showing you the side that I was. So there we go, it is an Indo-Persian battle axe. Is it 18th century? Is it 17th century? I don't think it's 19th century. Is it even earlier? Is it 16th century? Um, I don't know. Um, was it made for someone in India? Was it made uh, for or captured by someone somewhere else? Was it used in Mongolia? Perhaps China? Uh, Tibet? I, I just don't know. To me, those figures don't look like they're dressed in Indian clothes. They look more like Mongolian or perhaps Chinese clothes, something like that. And that script doesn't seem to match any Indian scripts I can find. In terms of what it is like as a weapon, normally that's what I talk about the most, but uh, in this video, not so much. I'll probably talk more about this as a weapon in a future video. But, and it is um, a heavy ax, but as I mentioned, it's a hollow shaft. So don't imagine that this is a solid piece of steel. It is nothing like the other Indian ax I was waving around the other day that was very light and very quick. This feels more like a mace. It feels quite like one of those windless maces or something like that. Um, so it's very much designed for boom, for a huge amount of uh, percussive force. Uh, and the edge is not thin. Um, it's a robust edge, but it was clearly sharp originally. Um, and clearly that side, the, the hammer side, very effective as a war hammer or a mace essentially. Um, so there we go, a beautiful, beautiful axe that I won't be selling anytime soon because it's quite hard to get hold of these and I've always fancied one. Um, and just before I go, I just want to draw your attention to the decoration up my shaft. 
so to speak um, and it is beautifully beautifully done what I might do is do a little bit more of an examination at some point of the decoration on this I do need to do a little bit of light cleaning on it but I'm only going to go very light because it's got very dark patina on it and I think if you if something's very dark with patina and you remove too much it just kind of looks like it's been messed around with and I don't want that because it's in nice untouched condition um, so as you can see it's got these spiral um, filed I would imagine carved, filed, not sure, um, sections one, two, three. And in between, it's got what appear to be smooth sections. They're actually kind of, I won't call them octagonal because I think there's more faces than that, um, but they little flat faces going all around. And on each one of those flat faces, I, I very much doubt you'll be able to see in this light, but on each of these flat faces is the remainder of some gold decoration. So this was a bling, expensive axe back in the day. And uh, the only other thing worth uh, mentioning at this stage, I think, is I, I did wonder, I thought one, two, three, these knurled sections, are they for extra friction for your hand? Almost certainly. Um, is it possible that those are seen as three gripping points? So if you're using it one-handed, usually you'll be gripping it about there, which is about right for most fighting axes. You usually have a bit extended below. Um, but sometimes you might want to choke up on the weapon and use it here if you're tired or if you're fighting in closer range. And indeed, as we know, sometimes you want to use an axe at that range. And of course, sometimes you might be using it two-handed. So it could be that those three points correspond to the common points that you might grip this axe in combat. Or it could just be that they're alternating smooth knurled, smooth knurled, smooth knurled. Um, so either way. But what we can say without any real shadow of a doubt is that whilst it is a cylindrical shaft, and incidentally the weight of the head tends to align it, I won't go on too much about that, but um, despite the fact it's a cylindrical shaft, it has actually got quite a lot of friction to it. And you can actually keep the thing in hand pretty, pretty damn easily because of those ridges and those knurls along there. And the final thing I'll mention is the pommel again, because I know you love pommels. Um, and an interesting thing is that technically your hand could slide down here, couldn't it? Um, but what's interesting is your bottom fingers naturally go into that groove. So if your hand slips down, dunk, that groove actually acts as a stop to stop your uh, hand slipping off. Additionally, it could also be for um, tying a silk knot, a silk lanyard, which you'd put your wrist through, wind it a few times, and then hold on so you can't drop things. So that has all sorts of purposes, potential purposes in there. Anyway, a lovely axe. I hope you enjoyed seeing it, and I'm sure you will see it. In fact, I'm certain you will see it in future videos, and we'll talk a bit more about some different aspects of this and other axes that I have in my collection. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.